Let's once again go to God in prayer. Uh, Father in heaven, uh, we lift up to you. Um, we lift up to you the nation of Brazil, uh, Bolivia. Um, and, and we pray, Father, for the church there. We pray, Father, for uh, Christians there uh, who uh, appear to be growing in number. And we thank you and praise you for the growth of your kingdom there. But we pray, God, uh, that believers in Bolivia would not uh, be susceptible to false teachings that uh, appear reportedly to be rampant. We pray, Father, that they would be discipled into sound doctrine, that they would know your word and be able to combat heresies and dangerous doctrines. We pray, Father, for leaders and pastors and teachers who are well-schooled on good doctrine, not formally necessarily, but well-trained and schooled by your saints and by your word. We pray, Father, that your church would be a leading voice against uh, rampant injustices in uh, Bolivian uh, society, that they would show uh, that culture, that uh, government, that civilization a better way, even as your Christians did uh, for so many years here. Um, maybe we have forgotten those efforts, but they are so needed there now. But we pray also, God, for your word to flourish. We pray that the work of translating the Bible into so many different uh, languages and tr of different tribes, especially in Bolivia, would continue unabated. We pray that the distribution uh, would be successful. But we also pray, Father, for the literacy necessary for Bolivians to make the use of these translations. We pray, Father, that by encountering your word, they would be transformed and changed by it, even as we sing, we are the people of your word. You created us by your word. You've transformed us by the word of your gospel. Would you transform the people of Bolivia by your word? Father, we pray for the, uh, the Chinese living and working in Angola. Um, and we pray, Father, um, uh, we pray for the Angolans who uh, maybe are dealing with uh, economic exploitation from that uh, work that's being done by China over Angola. And yet, at the same time, uh, we are thankful for the opportunity it provides that thousands of, of Chinese are, are being placed outside of the uh, sheltered firewall of the Communist Party. And so we pray, Father, for uh, believers in Angola to take advantage of this opportunity to bring the gospel into the lives of uh, Chinese men and women living and working in their country. And we pray for a revival, a, a work of new life among the Chinese in Angola. We pray that they would... Uh, re-import it back to China through the internet, through their returns to the mainland when they go home. And we pray for uh, the unstoppable force of your gospel throughout the Chinese-speaking world. Father, we pray here locally for um, our neighbors next door in East Cleveland and uh, with, with reports of uh, so many of their officers being arrested. And, um, and I know we are tempted, and I'm probably guilty of, of, of making East Cleveland a, a joke. Um, and yet it, there are real people there with, with real difficulties and real problems. And uh, God, we don't have all the answers, but we pray, uh, Father, for safety and protection. Uh, 
for the people in East Cleveland. We thank you and praise you for those police officers and other first responders who are doing good work, who are doing honest work, despite probably immense pressure to do differently. Maybe feeling overwhelmed by the lack of resources and hours and the odds stacked against them. Would you encourage them, God? We thank you that you have provided their service. We know that though they might be a different municipality, uh, we are all uh, connected and what happens there does not stay there. Everything spills over borders. And so we thank you for that, God. And we pray for churches in East Cleveland um, to spread the good news. that hearts and lives would be so transformed that they might have a season where this lack of policing would be inconsequential to them because of the power of your gospel. Father, would your gospel ring in our hearts this morning as we approach your word. Speak to us by your spirit. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We are continuing through the book of uh, 1 Samuel, so we're going to be in chapter 24 this morning and into the first verse of chapter 25. So 24 and then one verse of 25, so you can open your Bible app and scroll through there and swipe and tap your way to 1 Samuel 24 or grab the Bible you brought with you or that's under the seat in front of you and open up to 1 Samuel 24 and that's where we'll Start off. When Saul returned from following the Philistines, he was told, Behold, David is in the wilderness of Engedi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of all Israel and went to seek David and his men in the wilderness in front of the wild goats' rocks. And he came to the sheepfolds, by the way, where there was a cave. And Saul went in to relieve himself. Now, David and his men were sitting in the innermost parts of the cave. And the men of David said to him, Here is the day of which the Lord said to you, Behold, I will give your enemy into your hand, and you shall do to him as it shall seem good to you. And David arose and stealthily cut off a corner of Saul's robe. And afterward, David's heart struck him because he had cut off a corner of Saul's robe. He said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to put out my hand against him, seeing he is the Lord's anointed. So David persuaded his men with these words and did not permit them to attack Saul. And Saul rose up and left the cave and went on his way. Afterward, David also rose and went out of the cave and called after Saul, My Lord, the king! And Saul looked up, looked behind him, David bowed with his face to the earth and paid homage. And David said to Saul, Why do you listen to the words of men who say, Behold, David seeks your harm. Behold, this day your eyes have seen how the Lord gave you today into my hand in the cave. And some told me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not put out my hand against the Lord, against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. See, my father, the corner of your robe in my hand. For by the fact that I cut off the corner of your robe and did not kill you, you may know and see that there is no wrong or treason in my hands. I have not sinned against you, though you hunt my life to take it. May the Lord judge between me and you. May the Lord avenge me against you, but my hand shall not be against you. As the proverb of the ancients says, out of the wicked comes wickedness, but my hand shall not be against you. After whom has the king of Israel come out? After whom do you pursue? After a dead dog, after a flea. May the Lord therefore be judge. And give sentence between me and you, and see to it, and plead my cause, and deliver me 
from your hand. As soon as David had finished speaking these words to Saul, Saul said, Is this your voice, my son David? And Saul lifted up his voice and wept. He said to David, You are more righteous than I, for you have repaid me good, whereas I have repaid you evil. And you have declared this day how you have dealt well with me, in that you did not kill me when the Lord put me into your hands. For if a man finds his enemy, will he let him go away safe? So may the Lord reward you with good for what you have done to me this day. And now behold, I know that you shall surely be king and that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in your hand. Swear to me, therefore, by the Lord that you will not cut off my offspring after me and that you will not destroy my name out of my father's house. And David swore this to Saul. Then Saul went home, but David and his men went up to the stronghold. If you think about the most difficult things you've ever done, I mean, you finished a degree, or you got yourself out of debt, or you won that girl over, or whatever it was. I, I don't know what the hardest thing, but I think, you know, we, we tend to think of the, the, the positive things. What I mean by that is the, the things you can attach something to. But I think if you really dig down, very often the hardest things we do are really not the, the things that we, we did, but, but the things we didn't do, the, the negative things, the things that uh, where we, we, we subtracted something or, or we removed something from the equation. Because it's much, much easier. It's much, much easier to do something than to not do something. That's why, that's why they tell uh, addicts, right? Uh, if you are uh, addicted to something, you, know, you, you can't just cut it out. That's really hard to do. You have to replace the addiction with something else. I mean, how many times do you see somebody who is addicted to one thing, they, they, they get rid of that addiction, but then they replace it with a, another addiction? Hopefully it's one that's a little bit less evil, a little bit less bad, but it, it's almost like there's a, a necessity of replacing the doing with some other doing. It's really, really hard to not do. Those are the really difficult situations. And in this passage, we have David not doing something. And something that probably would have been very difficult for him to do. Something that out of his fear, I think would have been very natural for him to do. confronts three scenarios, a temptation, a confrontation, and a resignation. And in those three scenarios, I think we'll be able to put them together to draw a bigger, more important principle for how we can fight to win in those kind of situations. Last week, we were looking at 1 Samuel 23, and David was in the wilderness, or the, the desert, probably a better term, the desert between the towns of Ziph and Moan to the west, and the Dead Sea to the east. And, and an informant told King Saul his location, and Saul amasses an army that was... Uh, and he was nearly able to use this narrow, rocky peak to trap and surround David and his men. And David was in that position because he had fled the high ground as Saul approached. And it wasn't that he was afraid. On the contrary, it seems like David deliberately did not want to fight. And we saw that strength in the Lord allows us to let go 
of our battles. So rather than fighting, David was rescued by God's providence, by God's hand, when Saul was suddenly alerted that the Philistines, a a neighboring nation, uh, had raided the land. And so Saul was forced to abandon his quest to capture David at the 11th hour, and David was saved. And from there, David went on to the wilderness or the desert outside of En Gedi. En Gedi was right on the Dead Sea, which is famous for being nearly 10 times as salty as the ocean. And it's nearly devoid of any plants or fish, hence its name. But En Gedi itself was located at a freshwater spring, an, an oasis. It's still in the region of Judah, in the southern portion of Israel, which is David's tribe. So it kept David in a hostile, remote environment. It's a desert, relatively far from Saul, but hopefully at a place with some resources and hopefully at a location that Saul doesn't know about. But that doesn't last long. And that's where we pick up in chapter 24. Saul deals with the Philistines, and sometime later, it doesn't seem like it takes long, he hears that David is in En Gedi. He figures out David's new location very quickly, and he wastes no time in pursuing David yet again. This time he takes 3,000 chosen men to hunt him down. And when they get to the region, they arrive near the Wild Goats Rocks, which may or may not have been a place name, uh, something it just means the rocky area where any knowledgeable 10th century B.C. Israelite would have expected to find wild goats. But Saul has 3,000 men. David presumably still only has about 600. It's not a fair fight. But then something incredible happens. Saul is moved. Sorry, his Saul's bowels were moved. Check, check my notes there. Um, I don't, I don't know how much about the, uh, I don't know much about the social protocols of Bronze Age Levantine restroom habits, but it, it does seem like kings and VIPs were afforded more privacy and privilege than commoners. And and I'd wager that the average soldier, and we should get. We get little pieces of this in the scripture. The average soldier probably dug a little hole a few yards away from the campsite. But the king, the king was not going to do his business in the viewing of this band of brothers. So he goes to the cave. And given how little grows in this region, it's pretty desert. Like I said, uh, this is probably as private as it gets. And and fun fact, you you might be surprised at just how often the Bible speaks about pooping. It's a pretty pretty down-to-earth book when you really get to it. They just have different figures of speech for it. We we would say Saul went to the restroom. They said Saul covered his feet. We don't translate it that way because we wouldn't know what they're talking about, but that's what it literally says in Hebrew. What Saul didn't know, what he couldn't have known, was that of all the caves in this region, and there are a lot of caves in this region, David and his men were hiding in this one. It says in verse 3 that David and his men were sitting in the innermost parts of the cave. So they were deep into the cave. Saul didn't have any idea that they were there. It's, It's possible that They had been there for some time. If they had been there for some time, they'd found a portion of that cave that was very difficult to find or difficult to access. Or at the very least, they had the benefit of being familiar with the layout of this cave. And when we talked about David and the wilderness last week, I I mentioned that some scholars speculated that David might actually have had an advantage over Saul and might have been favored in a battle. I said then, and I I still say, I don't think that's likely. Saul's numbers advantage was just too large. David was a very skilled soldier. But 3,000 to 600 is just a tremendous numbers differential. 
But that's different all of a sudden because 3,000 to 600, five to one odds have just become one to 600. And David has the element of surprise. Not to mention, think for a moment, maybe you don't want to think about it, but, but how you feel when you use the restroom. Part of the reason I think we don't like being walked in on when we use the restroom, of course it's embarrassing, we want our privacy and things like that, but there's a part of it where we're, we're vulnerable, right? It's a pretty helpless situation to be in. And that's Saul's predicament. And so as we're reading the story, we're starting to feel like maybe this long game of cat and mouse between David and Saul will finally be over. And David's men think that as well. And they say to him, here is the day that the Lord told you. Behold, I will give your enemy into your hand and you shall do to him as it shall seem good to you. That's actually kind of interesting to read because so first we've heard about it. We have not read anything in the first 23 chapters of 1 Samuel about a prophecy like this. So what's going on? Well, one possibility is that they completely made this up because it's what they want to be true. They would not be the first people to try to use God's name for their own gain. They just see in the circumstances of life, this is God's doing. And so what do you do in a situation like this? God obviously was telling you, David, to kill him. Or they're just lying. Another possibility is that they heard something like it. Maybe it's become embellished over time, or they've just kind of twisted it around in their head. We do like to twist God's word sometimes, don't we? When David first ran from Saul, the very first time, Saul's son, Jonathan, who is David's close friend, blessed David and made a covenant with David and asked David to, in his words, not cut off your steadfast love from my house forever when the Lord cuts off every one of the enemies of David from the face of the earth. And the text goes on and says, And Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, May the Lord take, take vengeance on David's enemies. That's the closest thing we have to what the soldiers are saying here. Maybe this covenant and this blessing that Jonathan, Saul's own son, gave to David somehow got built up into something slightly different, something more in the soldiers' minds. And along those lines of thinking, it, it, it's possible that the second part of that statement from the soldiers you shall do to him as it seems good to you. It's, it's possible that part was not supposed to be quoting prophecy. In, in, you know, in the ancient world, we, they didn't have quotation marks. So sometimes, sometimes it's a little hard to know. It's usually it's really obvious. But every once in a while, it's like, where, where should you put the quotation marks? And, and so maybe the, the quotation was just on... Uh, a, a, maybe the quotation was just simply... Uh, that the, the Lord said he was, uh, was going to give you these enemies, and now this is their advice to him. Ah, the Lord did what he said he's going to do, so our advice to you now is you shall do to him as seems good to you. They think God has told David he'll give his enemies into his hand. They think this is evidence of that coming true, and they think that David should now do whatever he thinks seems good in his own eyes which is horrible advice. At the end of the day, though, it doesn't matter where the men got the idea that God had said this. 
or whether they believed it or not. What matters is they said it, and the implication is clear. They think David should kill Saul and end the national nightmare. Put an end to this running around in the desert. Put an end to fleeing from forest to cave to desert to foreign land. Put an end to running from the injustice of Saul's kingdom and begin to put their lives back together, to start over, to settle down, to live. And David can put an end to all of that by putting an end to one very, very bad man who has done nothing but hurt him nearly his entire adult life. A man who, frankly, legally, by Israel's own law, deserved to be under a death sentence. That's what David's men think. What does David think? Well, we have to gain our insights by what he does. He creeps forward into the cave stealthily, unannounced, unnoticed, gets up close to the stench. He lays a hold of Saul's royal robes and he removes a corner of it. But then we read afterward, I don't know how long afterward, but sometime afterward, David's heart struck him because he had cut off a corner of Saul's robe. It's just kind of an unusual expression that appears only one other time. It's a time when David really felt like he screwed up, and he had much, much later in the story. David is struck with guilt over this really simple action. Why? There's a lot of theories that are kind of thrown out there, and there's likely a little bit of truth to all of them. You know, in that part of the ancient world, the royal robes were a symbol of the royalty itself, and to cut off these robes was not just a matter of tearing a garment. It was also perhaps an attack on Saul's kingship, the very thing that David seemed to have no desire to do. It may have also simply been the fact that David felt guilty about causing any harm to Saul, even if it was just a little bit of material harm. But whatever the exact reason, it seems clear that David, despite having every reason in the world to hate Saul, and every reason in the world to wish that Saul was dead was dead set against hurting him. David's men tempted him to do something that would give him exactly what he wanted. Peace from his enemies, freedom from persecution, power as king, and revenge. That's a pretty good package. These were his friends. These were his trusted advisors. But it went against his conscience. And more importantly than that, it went against the law of his God. It must have seemed very strange, but in that moment, in that cave near the Dead Sea at the spring of Engedi, David's greatest enemy was not Saul. It was his own friends. Our, our general instinct is to be loyal to those who are most loyal to us. Many of us live with fear, sometimes paralyzing, crippling fear of alienating people, of pushing people away, of losing people. And so we'll sometimes trespass or cross our own moral boundaries just a little, sometimes a little more than a little, sometimes a lot, just to keep them around, just so we don't lose them. But David knew there was someone who had been more loyal to him than any of these men, and that he could not bring himself to push him away, even if it cost him his friends, even if it meant sparing his enemy. 
I'm speaking, of course, of the Lord. The Lord had been constantly faithful to David. And David's men, David's men had tried to persuade David into doing something evil, using God's name as a justification. So instead of David attacking Saul, David attacks his friends. Look at verses 6 and 7. He, he said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to put up my hand against him, seeing that he is the Lord's anointed. So David persuaded his men with these words and did not permit them to attack Saul. Essentially, David was saying, What you are saying about God is untrue. You are bearing false witness about God. God did not say that I should do whatever I please to Saul. There's a little bit of a callback there to the garden, isn't there? Where the serpent comes to Eve and says, Did God say this? And the right response would have been Adam stepping in and saying, Whoa, God did not say that. But Adam stayed silent and went along with it. But here David has heard temptation and said, No, this is not what God has said. What you're saying sounds good. It's what I want, but it's not what God has said. God did not say that I should do whatever I please to Saul. In fact, he forbids me from doing anything to harm this man. Now, I don't think David had heard a specific prophecy about God from this, about this. I think David just understood God's word. He understood righteousness. He understood justice. He understood the demands of God's rule. He understood the scriptures. In Exodus 22, God's word says, you shall not revile God nor curse a ruler of your people. That commandment connected rulers and leaders as extensions of God's divine authority, however imperfect they might be. It's an idea that the Apostle Paul picks up on in Romans 13 when he writes to Christians, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. So if David was forbidden from cursing a ruler of his people, how much more was he forbidden from killing the king of his people? He would not do it. Boy, is that, is that a tough lesson for us as American Christians. Not to curse a ruler of your people. The whole idea of American democracy is predicated, it seems, on cursing the rulers of our people. Oh, that's a different sermon. Verse 7 says he persuaded his men, but that's too weak. That's too weak. The word there is usually, it's always translated cut. It never means persuaded. They translated persuaded because they weren't sure what to do with the word cut. But I think uh, some scholars have, have said, you know what, like, the best way to take that is probably tore them to pieces. He excoriated them. David let 600 men know in no uncertain terms that this was not the way. David fought his men. Not with a sword, but, but with his words and with his actions, because his men were a source of temptation. And he fought that temptation 
with his knowledge of God and God's word. His men listened. It wouldn't have mattered, though, if they didn't listen. Because David needed to do what was right, no matter what. And David did what was right. Brothers and sisters, if you are a Christian, this is how we fight temptation. We fight temptation with our knowledge of God. And we know God because he has revealed himself to us in his word and supremely in Jesus Christ. And so with that, Saul exited the cave. None the wiser, but I assume several ounces lighter. So the scene moves outside the cave and doesn't wait too long to reveal himself. Saul doesn't seem to have an army with him, so he might just be outside uh, the sight of his troops. There doesn't seem to be an immediate danger to David, although query whether he could have known that. And he steps out, and he immediately calls to Saul, My lord the king! And when Saul looked behind him, David bowed with his face to the earth and paid homage. What a remarkable thing. David isn't just refusing to hurt Saul. He's honoring him. He's honoring this man who has repeatedly tried to kill him. One day, David's son, Solomon, would write down a proverb whether he crafted the proverb himself or he collected it from the sayings of other wise men, maybe his own father included, we can't know. But he wrote this, and it was quoted by uh, the Apostle Paul in the passage that Sully read this morning, which is actually just a coincidence. Uh, If your enemy is hungry, give him bread to eat, and if he is thirsty, give him water to drink for you will heap burning coals on his head, and the Lord will reward you. Of course, honoring the king did not mean he wouldn't challenge him. No, David was going to challenge him, politely, but firmly. And the opening charge he levels against Saul is devastating in this context because he says why do you listen to the words of men who say behold david seeks your harm so david has of course never demonstrated in the least that he desires to harm saul he has only ever served saul every time he's been in proximity of saul he's run away and in his hand or in his pocket somewhere on his person he has evidence of that fact But his words cut a little deeper here, don't they? Because Saul has been listening to men, advisors, who tell him that David wants to harm him. What just happened? David has just rejected the words of men who told him to harm Saul. Saul listens to men. David doesn't. Saul listens to men. David listens to God. The counsel Saul receives leads to his self-destruction. And the counsel that David receives leads to the preservation of life. And ironically, it produces the exact opposite result in David that Saul was told was true. And then he pulls out the piece of the rope, like a courtroom lawyer holding out that surprise twist for the jury. Saul must now confront this reality that that he might have been only a hair away from death just moments ago if David had been any other 
sort of man. And you can almost hear the pleading, you can hear the emotion in, in David's words when he says, See my father, see the corner of your robe in my hand, for by the fact that I cut off the corner of your robe and did not kill you, you may know and see that there is no wrong or treason in my hands. I have not sinned against you, though you hunt my life to take it. Father. It may have been because Saul was his father-in-law. It may have been because as a servant in the king's court, Saul became David's protector and benefactor. And that would have been a term they would have used. But it was a, a term nonetheless of intimacy and familiarity and warmth. I can imagine a lot of choice words that David might have used to refer to Saul. But he chose Father. And he positioned himself as the son who is being hunted like a, like a deer or a wild turkey. And with all hope, lost david casts himself on the lord for justice may the lord judge between me and you may the lord avenge me against you but my hand shall not be against you a definitive absolute statement that david was not going to work in the ways of retribution He's telling Saul that he is convinced that he's right. He's convinced that he's, des that he's deserving of justice. But he will leave it entirely in God's hand. He is not a threat to Saul. Like they say, David says, out of the wicked comes wickedness. I used to not understand Proverbs like that one. They seem so obvious, right? Like, wickedness comes from the wicked. Out of the wicked comes wickedness. Like, that just seems really obvious, right? What's the point? And you read the book of Proverbs. There's a lot of Proverbs that are, that are similar to that. And I don't think, it, it wasn't until a few years ago that I really started to get it. No, like, from, from the wicked comes wickedness. No, no, no. Do you see wickedness? Yeah. Then that came from a wicked person. Because what do we like to do? We see wickedness and we say, oh, but they're a good person. Isn't that what we do, right? We see evil and we go like, yeah, but they got a good heart. The Bible reminds us that, as Jesus said, you will know them by their fruit. And sometimes we just need that kind of that slap in the face that it's just, sometimes it's just, it's just that simple. It's just that obvious. The wicked produced wickedness. David's saying, look, where's the wickedness here? I had, I had means, motive, and opportunity. And yet, there's no crime. And yet it's also kind of a backhanded slap to Saul, isn't it? Because there's plenty of wickedness coming from the other side of this conversation. And David closes by speaking of himself in humble terms. He's a nothing, he says. He's a nobody. Of course, that's not true in the sense he's made in God's image, he's valuable, and yes, we're all special. But what he's saying is he's, he's just one man in a large kingdom. He's, he's nothing. He should be nothing to Saul. Why is he anything to Saul? Why is a man who has everything concerned with a man living in caves, in dirt, in the wilderness, minding his own business, he is of no consequence. He is certainly no threat. And it's this amazing scene. David has spent 
what is at least months and probably more like years now, living away from family, living away from friends and home and anything that looks like normal. He's been living the life of an outlaw, but without any of the romance of a Western. The last time David saw Saul, he was still a courtesan in the capital. And Saul was suffering because God had sent a spirit to trouble him after he continually rebelled against God. But David would play the lyre for Saul to soothe him. And it was during one of those episodes and Saul hurled a spear at David. And it wasn't the first time that Saul had tried to harm David, but it was the last time that David would sit idly by. And so David fled. And they had not spoken since. And this is the moment, after all these months, maybe years, the first time that David is able to be face to face with this man. What courage that took to have this confrontation. Where does that courage come from? It didn't come from looking at King Saul in all of his glory and his height. Remember how he was so tall and well-built and strong? David didn't gather his courage by looking at the field out past Saul where the army was camped, 3,000 soldiers, that certainly would not have given David the courage. It wasn't Saul's luxurious robes and signs of power and stateliness. But in that moment, David gathered his courage from God. After this long speech, at least long by Bible standards, uh, Saul speaks up. Is, is it really David? Maybe he's too far away to see clearly. Maybe it's been too many years. Maybe he's in disbelief. But is that, is that really you, my son, David? For a moment, the threat is abated. Saul calls him son. And he calls him by name for the first time in a long time. If you've, if you've been following along, you, you notice that Saul has resorted to just calling him the son of Jesse. He doesn't even call his own son-in-law David anymore. He just calls him the son of Jesse. For the first time in a long time, he calls him David. And he calls him son. And he weeps. But unfortunately, it's not tears of repentance. And we know that because of the next several chapters in this book. That's a spoiler. Saul doesn't change. Repentance is a change. That's what repentance means. Repentance doesn't mean you feel bad. That's not repentance. Repentance is a change in direction. And Saul does not change direction. He might have felt bad in this moment. Or maybe he's just overwhelmed with emotion, realizing how close he came to death. Tears are a common response in those situations. But whatever the case, he had the clarity of thought to acknowledge two things. First, at least in that moment, he had the clarity of thought to acknowledge that David was in the right. When he says, you are more righteous than I, that's something like a legal declaration that means something like, between the two of us in this affair, you're the one on the up and up. You're the one that is in the right. He realizes that David has done good for him by sparing his life when all he's done is do evil by seeking to take David's life. And Saul realizes that the basic military strategy is to kill your enemy when you have the chance. And so if David really sees Saul as his enemy, he would have killed him. And so David must not see Saul as his enemy. 
if David wanted Saul dead, he would be dead. Second, Saul acknowledges for the first time that David will be king in his place. In chapter 23, last week we said Jonathan, Saul's son, told David that Saul knew that was true. But now Saul finally admits it for himself in his own words. In the world of that time, it would have been very common especially if the successor to a king was not their own son or perhaps daughter, so there was a usurper to the throne, that that usurper would then kill off any other potential heirs to the throne so that nobody else could come in later. Because after all, any of Saul's many children or grandchildren would have a name. They'd have a reputation. They would have some some power. They'd have some connections. They'd have a sense of birthright. And people might follow them. And from a purely calculating point of view, it would make sense to get rid of the competition, just kill them all off, and then nobody can try to make one of them king. That's how things often worked in that region of the world at that time, and Saul's concerned about that. He knows David is going to be king, and so he asks David for something. When he becomes king, don't kill off my descendants. That's actually a really big request. And David swears he will not do it. Again, that's a big request. That might seem obvi- like obviously to us, you, you, you lose a presidential contest, you don't kill off all your opponent's uh, rivals, you know, or all your opponent's uh, potential successors. Um, but in that day and age, it was often, of course you kill your political rivals. Of course you do. But not David. And so we have this resignation that Saul, Saul is, has a resignation to the fact that he will not get the best of David. At least this day, he has that resignation. There's something sinister about sin, though, isn't there? That it, that it keeps bubbling up in our hearts and keeps trying to break out It's like uh, mold spores, right? You can scrape it off the surface. But as long as you just keep scraping it off the surface, it's just going to keep growing back because the spores are invisible and they're hidden deep down in the substance. You've got to cut it out deep. You've got to get the fungicide down, soaked into whatever it is that it's growing in. Sin is like that. You've got to cut it out from the bottom because sin wants to keep bubbling up in our hearts until it is absolutely killed, put to death, and snuffed out. And we're going to see that Saul can't keep sin down. And I think that's why this passage ends the way it does. Saul goes back to the capital, to his home in Gibeah. And even though it seems like there's this detente, there's this peace, David does not go home. David does not return to Bethlehem. David does not go to Moab and get his mom and dad and bring them home. They go to a desert stronghold near En Gedi. He's still seeking protection. And then... um, I forgot to read the top of chapter 25. At the top of chapter 25, verse 1, Now Samuel died, and all Israel assembled and mourned for him, and they buried him in his house at Ramah. Then David arose and went down to the wilderness of Paran. Samuel dies. The prophet, the priest, the judge, who had been so central to the life of his nation, 
It was central to seeing Saul come to power, central to seeing David come to national prominence. Perhaps one of the most, if not the most, trusted figure remaining after all of this hostility. And the country mourns for him. If there was anyone who could have maybe truly brokered some sort of peace, maybe it would have been Samuel. But he's gone. It feels like the end of an era. And so maybe it's telling that as soon as Samuel dies, David and his men go to the wilderness, or again, desert of Paran, which is even further south. It's about as far south, the exact location is debated, but it's about as far south as you can go and still be in anything like what we would call Israel at that time. He's going as far away from Saul as possible. David certainly doesn't believe that Saul's vendetta is over. Why not? Saul cried. Saul proclaimed that David was innocent. Saul said nice things about David's future. Saul begged David for promises. But in all the resignations of Saul, David still put no trust in the words of a man. He was trusting his God to make things right in his time. I think many of us would be taken in by Saul. Not because we're naive, but because after such a long, hard string of bad news, sometimes we just want to believe that things are turning around. We just want to believe something good for a change. Sometimes it's just easier to trust the person in front of us telling us something good than to trust God when it's hard. But David was trusting God to make things right in his time. So David endured temptation. David made a bold confrontation. And David did not get taken in by words of resignation from his enemy. Why? Because David feared God more than he feared any man, any human being. And the fear of the Lord overcomes the fear of man. The fear of the Lord overcomes the fear of human beings. The way that the faithful are to make their way in this world, the way that we live successfully, and by successfully, I mean faithfully, in a way that ultimately pleases God and leads to hearing Him on that last day saying, well done, good and faithful servant. As we fear Him more than we fear human beings. We trust Him more than we trust human beings. We take Him at His word more than we take human beings at their word. At every opportunity in this story, human circumstances would have pointed David to a very different type of outcome. But at every opportunity, he trusted what God had done for him and what God had promised him and what God had spoken in his word, and he took it to the bank. 
even when it was hard, even when it meant not doing something that seemed so obviously the right thing to do. When we are facing our biggest challenges, it is the fear of God, the trust in the Lord, and hearing His voice that will lead us to make the faithful decisions. Let's pray. Father, may we be a people who fear you more than we fear any man. And may our convictions about what you have taught us and our knowledge of who you are and what you are like give us the strength to overcome temptation and the strength to boldly confront our fears and the strength to resist seductive promises of easier lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.